Hi everyone, my name is Mercy. Welcome to my channel. I'm super excited for you to be here and in this video I'm actually going to be talking about the high yield topics that are going to be seen on ob shelf exam and then um, I'm sure it's going to be seen on the ob section of the step two. So now this is not much of a material for step one um, because it's a lot more details and actually a lot of the things for ob I had to like learn for first time. There's like a lot that I was just like, what? I've never seen it before. So it was a little stressful um, studying for it just because there was so much. I'll tell you my recommendation on how to study for it in another video, but this video is just going to talk about the high yield topics. And also as I'm gonna list the high yield topics, like what you definitely need to know, and make sure you get a piece of paper and a pen and write these down. So let's get started. First trimester bleeding, second trimester bleeding. So first trimester bleeding, you're gonna think of more of the spontaneous abortion. There are five different types of spontaneous abortions missed threatened inevitable incomplete and complete they'll do a usmla concept story for this one because it's a, actually a really good one to know uh, so i'll go into more details for that so stay tuned make sure you hit the subscribe button to not miss that one these are not in any particular order, by the way. High to the four mole is really important, and it's really uh, important to understand that the complete mole um, has beta HCG that's really high, and that they're also going to present with hyperemesis. So that's something that they'll clue you in to go towards a mole presentation rather than a spontaneous abortion. And then you have your third trimester bleeding, and this you want to think of placenta previa, placenta abruptio, placenta abruption, um, same thing. If they're going to come in, complaining of either painful or painless bleeding. Now, the way they describe it in the vignette, it gets confusing. Sometimes they might not make it obvious that it's painful. So any tenderness, any back pain, consider this as a painful uh, third trimester bleeding. Vaginosis, vaginitis, candidiasis, these are super important. The way they treat it, what kind of presentation, such as the pH, they'll tell you the pH of the vaginal discharge, whether it's 4.5 or less than that or more than that you'll see like a bunch of questions on this cervical cancer yes so high yield you need to know how to treat it like how you're going to manage it you need to know the criteria of what you have to do next they ask a lot of next step in management be able to diagnose the disease and then know what to do next endometrial cancer uh, so risk factors are really important okay so if you're pregnant and you have hpv um what do you do next that's really important once like you get a pap smear that's um, positive or abnormal you're going to in a pregnant woman you're going to do a colposcopy for sure however once you do a colposcopy in a pregnant woman it's not that bad then you're not going to go further on you're not going to do a biopsy unless it's really bad um, and you are definitely not going to do an endometrial curtage. Uh, Granulosa tumors release estrogen so if they release estrogen they're going to have an endometrial hyperplasia because of the estrogen effect on it serotolylytic which is going to be just testosterone remember testosterone is an androgen which causes you know the woman's going to come in with hairiness all over her stress incontinence now stress incontinence i did a u world concept series on that one go ahead and check that out if someone has clear fluid that's constantly leaking through their vagina and they had a previous uh, history of radiation surgery or some kind of surgery in the pelvis region you are going to recognize that this is most likely a fistula that's causing this constant leakage through the vagina. Primary amenorrhea. This is super important, both primary and secondary. And I'm actually going to have your world concept series on both of them. So many details that you need to know about it. So definitely make sure you have that under your belt. And stay tuned for my year world concept series on both of them. Acute abdominal pain. So that's your ectopic pregnancy. There's so many questions on that. It could be appendicitis, PID ovarian torsion, ovarian cysts cause acute abdominal pain in a woman that's in reproductive age. Lichen sclerosis, precancerous lesion that's in the vulva region. Elderly that comes in, they're itching, and then when you look down there, it is white um, on the sides there. They'll say it's like white wrinkly lesions. Remember that you always wanna do a punch biopsy because you can have vulvar cancer. After they've delivered, the uterus needs to firm up. 
and if it doesn't if it's boggy that's a keyword if it's boggy it's not firm uh, it's enlarged then you'll definitely uh, recognize that this is abnormal the first thing massage and oxytocin and if it doesn't firm up they're gonna continuously hemorrhage and there's a problem if the uterus is firm and they continue to bleed after they've delivered both the placenta and the baby what you want to think of is go back and see for any laceration all these things that we're learning are so important for when we go into medicine yes we might not be an ob person but it's something that we have to understand and i love when things make sense in the connect so beta cg is something that is seen in pregnancy and actually that's what we look at in the urine to identify that someone's pregnant or not, right? So Vinny CG, where is it coming from? It's coming from the syncytial trophoblast, uh, what's implanting essentially um, to then form the placenta. So it's coming from the syncytial trophoblast specifically, which uh, stimulates the corpus luteum or keeps it alive to produce progesterone. And this beta CG is going to be really high, but then eventually it comes back down. So by the end of the first trimester, it begins to decline and it peaks at about 100,000. So Super important at 100,000. If you see someone with 500,000 beta CG level, you're not gonna think pregnancy. You're going to think of a complete mole or a choriocarcinoma. <laughs> So that beta ECG level is important, and the beta ECG level being excessively high causes hyperemesis, which is excessive vomiting. So that's why whenever someone's pregnant, in the early stages of pregnancy, they're going to complain about how they're vomiting. Now, a little bit of vomiting is fine, but if it's excessively vomiting, they're going to get dehydrated, so we usually um, admit them, and we try to hydrate them, and we give them antiemetics. But also something to recognize with beta ECG level, they also look, the beta ECG looks like FSH, it looks like LH, it looks like TSH. So you can even potentially see someone with hyperthyroidism and, and during pregnancy. Now they never had hyperthyroidism, but all of a sudden they're producing hyperthyroidism-like effect. That's because it looks so much like the TSH and it's producing excess in that reason. So if you see a vignette with someone with palpitations and and, you know excessive sweating recognize that baby CG could be doing that in a pregnant woman okay so I feel like this is getting really long polycystic ovarian syndrome is important recognizing the different types of contraceptives is important the number one vaginal bleeding in a child always pick foreign body adenomyosis theomyoma endometriosis and the breast masses it's really important to recognize the different masses and what you do next so when you find a mass what do you do it has to be age appropriate so 27 year old with a mass what do you do so it's really important to recognize when do you do an ultrasound when, when do you do an, a mammography of uh, finding endo aspiration with postmenopausal what is the hormone that it's high FSH. Definitely know your preeclampsia, eclampsia, and health. And with preeclampsia, there's mild and there's severe. Recognize what makes a severe. When do you give vaccinations? Because there are uh, criteria for, like, for example, hepatitis. B and A, um, you give these vaccines in someone that has chronic hepatitis C, but you're not going to give anyone MMR and V. And I always say MMR V, varicella is also contraindicated because it's live attenuated, all four are. Another high yield is the Rogam. So when do you give Rogam? Every time there is any procedure, whether abortion, ectopic pregnancy, anything where there may have been mix of blood, you're going to give Rogam. On a general basis, you, if they're negative 28 weeks, you give Rogam, and then within 72 hours postpartum, you give Rogam. To someone that has RH negative mom, with an RH positive baby. Now you won't know the baby's um, status. If you know the dad's status is negative and mom's is negative, you're not gonna treat the baby. But if the mom's is negative, the baby, we don't know yet, so we're going to, and it's the first pregnancy, we're going to give Rogam. And then there are other criteria, know them. Gestational diabetes. Also know that glucose tolerance test is done between 24 and 28 weeks. And amniotic fluid embolism. Know the difference between the two. One of the biggest clue with amniotic 
amniotic fluid embolism is that they're going to be bleeding from everywhere. And the adverse effects of oxytocin, this is one of the really important drugs that we give um, and it's important to know the adverse effects. And there are three things, hypotension, um, hyponatremia, and tachycystole. And it's also important to recognize when you give magnesium, when you give beta-methasone, as well as tocolytics. So tocolytics are basically uh, going to relax the uterus so it doesn't contract. And this is commonly given to preterms whenever we're giving them beta-methasone to relax the uterus so that the, um, uh, the beta-methasone has Bimethasone is a corticosteroid, so that has the effect on the fetus before it comes out. And also know um, cervical incompetence. Cervical incompetence is definitely a good one too because they'll uh, have a history of a lot of preterms. Um, and what do you do in someone that has cervical incompetence? What you definitely need to know is the effacement versus dilation. So think of, so here is the uterus and then this right here where my hands are this this whole all my fingers that is the cervix so you have the uterus and then the cervix and then you have the vagina so this cervix is going to get effaced and this is effacement so this is a hundred percent effacement this is zero percent effacement so when they say effacement it's basically how much the cervix is kind of coming up and kind of like you know going along with the uterus and then dilation is how much it's opened up so if they say 60% effacement and it's three centimeters dilation they'll have dilation and effacement that's so this is dilation this is like opening it up effacement the labor phases you need to know there's phase one latent and phase one active so the latent phase is when it becomes a faced and the um, the active phase is when it dilates we want the dilation to be up to 10 and that is when we get to stage 2 there are four different tracings that you definitely have to know there's the early uh, deceleration late deceleration and var variable deceleration the early deceleration that is going to be seen in a baby that has the head compressing against the uterus so it's just the baby's head compressing that's fine but if you have variable decelerations these are basically cord compressions uh, cord prolapse or there's one other I can't think of the third one, but usually it's the first two, cord uh, prolapse or cord compression. And then you have the late deceleration, and this is going to be hypoxia. So this is the bad one. Whenever I took over online meds Instagram, I think I talked about that then on their uh, Instagram stories. But essentially, that is a really important thing to recognize. Those three, and then also if they have fetal tachycardia, this is commonly due to maternal fever. So I hope that was really helpful. Uh, let me know if that was of any help once you've taken the shelf exam because I'm sure you'll see a lot of those topics on there. Uh, so thank you again and I'll see you guys in the next video. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and do share these videos as they'll be super helpful. And I'll see you guys on the next one.